Hi, and thank you for watching this video about salvation versus works, and I pray that this will bless you. I first posted this on Facebook, but many people complained that the post was too long and that it would be impossible to read. I decided to put this information together based on promptings I believe the Lord has given me regarding a very important subject, and as such I will do my best to share with you what the Lord showed me from His Word. The subject that we will be looking at today will deviate from watching for prophetic events that are occurring in the world, and we are going to look at the subject of salvation and how the works that we do after we are saved should be viewed from a biblical perspective. The reason I would like to discuss this is because of the various points of view of people I have encountered where their understanding conforms to some passages in the Word, but they also refute what is written in other passages of the Bible. Some of the main points that I would like to address in the study today include the following. What is salvation and what happens when we are saved? What is our motive for the works that we do when we are saved? How does our condition as human beings transform from before we are saved compared to after we are saved? What are God's standards that He uses when He judges sin and how do these apply to us after we are saved? How do we deal with the fact that we see sin remaining in our lives after we are saved and does this impact our salvation? How does punishment for sin fit into the picture and how should we understand this? Some of the comments and questions that I have encountered and which prompted me to make this video include the following and we will address them as we go along. How can people who do not try to keep the law after they are saved expect to remain saved if they continue in sin? We draw closer to God when we repent daily of our sins and this allows us to walk a closer walk with God. Not wanting to keep the law of the Old Testament is looking for an excuse to continue in our desire to sin. I am only covered by the blood of Jesus if I live my life by doing His will. When you are saved, you have to live your life in such a way that you can become more and more like Jesus. There are so many opinions on these matters, but I believe we have to stay focused on the Word of God alone in order to get to the truth. Whatever we believe and understand in the end, when we compare it to what is written in all of God's Word, has to support all scripture and not contradict any specific passages. That is my approach to all subjects in the Bible and I do my best to reach an understanding that does not contradict scripture, taking into account everything I can find about the subject. However, I am not perfect and I may miss something and if you find contradictions between what I say today and what is written in the word, Please point these out to me, and I will respond where possible, either pointing out how my understanding does not contradict the passage in question, or adjust my understanding to include that passage. Remember that our understanding about matters may differ based on how we fit all scriptures about a subject together. But when everything is combined, we should have an understanding that includes all relevant scripture without contradicting any. I apply the following passages to my study of the Word of God. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. For today's study, I have to provide substantial detail in order to bring my point across, as it is so easy to get confused between what we believe pleases our Heavenly Father and what the Word tells us about the matter. So let us get started and approach this very contentious subject. When it comes to our salvation, 
What understanding does the Word of God give us regarding our redemption? The Bible tells us that we are all sinners and sinners become part of our being when Adam sinned and that we were born sinners and sold to sin. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. When Adam sinned, God pronounced a curse of death over our bodies, which changed from glorified to corruptible. Something interesting to note is that it would seem that sin is passed on to future generations through the male gender, since although Eve was the first person to have sinned, the Bible keeps track of Adam's fall into sin, and this would also provide a reason for the fact that Jesus had no earthly father. Jesus was a direct creation of our Heavenly Father, and as such, His physical body, even though similar to our corrupt bodies, did not have a sinful nature as ours do. The Bible continues to tell us that even though we, who are all descendants of Adam, have all been affected by the sin of one man, God loved every one of us from before creating the earth. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. This passage tells us that God knew every one of us even before he created the earth. Because he is not bound by time and space, he knew then what choices we would make with the free will that was given to us, and despite our choices, even when we choose against him, he still loves us and is not willing that anyone should perish. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. He loved us so much that he decided to do for us that which we were not able to do. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. After we came under the curse of Adam's sin, we had no way in which we could restore our once intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father, as we needed someone who was not under the curse to pay the price. God's requirements for perfection was shown to us in the law that God gave to Moses, in which he also provided pointers to the Messiah that would one day fulfill all his requirements in perfection. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The purpose of the law then was to school us in understanding what God's requirements are for a perfect walk with Him, and to recognize the Messiah when He came to fulfill all the requirements in perfection. The Bible also tells us that the law is spiritual, showing us that we are not able to achieve its requirements in the flesh. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Because we all live in bodies that are sold under sin, there is no way in which we can attain to that which can only be done in the Spirit, and the Word explains to us that the law is spiritual. We needed someone who was sinless, having no sin in his body, to pay the price for our sins, and to free us from the curse. This is what our Heavenly Father did when He sent us His Son Jesus Christ, 
to lay down his life in our place, taking on all of our sins and imputing his righteousness to us in exchange. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How do we obtain salvation according to the word of God? And now that Jesus gave his sinless life for us, what does our Heavenly Father expect of us? We read the following. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible clearly states that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. There is no other way in which we can be saved, and Jesus confirms this for us in John 14. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Following any other religion or belief in which Jesus is not recognized as the Son of God, who came to set us free from our sins, will burden you with works of the flesh, and will greatly disappoint you when you, one day, will stand before our Heavenly Father to be judged. What happens when we are born again and when we receive salvation? First we need to understand how we as human beings are put together. We have a body that is cursed because of Adam's sin, and a spirit that is dead before we are saved. Between these two aspects exists our soul, or the person that we are with our will and ability to choose, also forming part of this section. We will look at these three aspects of our being in more detail as we continue. Many people would say that when we are born again, we receive the Holy Spirit, or we invite the Holy Spirit to come and live in us. But how this happens is often misunderstood. We are often taught that when we are saved, we have allowed the Holy Spirit into our heart. But then we need to work it out in order to allow Him to control more and more of our lives through a process that is called sanctification. We then do our best to become more like Jesus. But is this really what the Word of God shows us? Let us see what is written. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In Colossians chapter 2 we read that when we are saved, we are quickened together with Jesus, and all our sins, which means past, present, and future, have been forgiven. We also see in verse 10, that the Word of God tells us that we are complete in Him. How does this address the concept of allowing the Holy Spirit into our heart and going through a process in which we gradually hand over control of more and more aspects of our life as we work to become more like Jesus? From what we read in the following verse, you will see that this concept is not really biblical, even though this is what we are often taught. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Now what the word shows us in this passage is something completely different. According to God's word, when we are born again, our dead spirit is quickened or made alive, and it becomes one or a single entity when it is combined with the Holy Spirit that indwells us from this point forward. There is then no distinction between our spirit and the Holy Spirit if they have become one. 
and it affects to a large degree our understanding of other concepts in the Word of God when we realize this. We can in most instances not sense this when it happens in our physical body, because the body cannot perceive spiritual things. This process of being born again, and where our dead spirit is regenerated and joined with the Holy Spirit, only affects our spirit man and one third of our total being, and there is still our soul and body that we have to consider. What else do we read from God's Word that could give us more insight into this matter when it comes to our bodies? Paul shows us the following. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So after our spirit has become one with the Holy Spirit, we still have to endure our flesh, which remains in sin. Our bodies are not glorified when we come to salvation. They remain sinful until the day that we die, or the day in which we are changed, when the rapture as described by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 occurs. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. However, when we are saved, the Word of God tells us that we are sealed with a promise that awaits us when our corruptible bodies will be transformed into that which God had redeemed us for, which is specifically for God's glory. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. This passage describes a promise that involves our bodies, which remain corrupted while we are alive, and there is nothing that we can do about that while we are alive. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, an house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. While we are alive, we long to have our glorified bodies that will be eternal and sinless, having the law of God written on our new hearts. And this will happen during one of several resurrections that will take place. One of these resurrection events has already happened, and this occurred when Jesus was resurrected as the first of the first fruits of God's faith harvest, also represented by the barley harvest. He was, however, not alone, and both Paul and John describe those that were resurrected with Jesus seated on twenty-four thrones in heaven, as described to us by John, and these are also known as the twenty-four elders. Most of them are described in Hebrews 11, and we can also find others that are not mentioned here if we search the scriptures. One such person is the thief on the cross next to Jesus. Many will cringe at the thought that this sinful man, who declared his faith in Jesus shortly before Jesus died, would occupy one of the twenty-four thrones of the elders. But if you compare his qualities and actions shortly before Jesus' death, to those mentioned in Hebrews 11 that describe the elders to us, we can check off all the attributes that are part of the elders mentioned in Hebrews 11. 
Jesus also assured this thief that he would be with him in paradise that same day. The 24 elders have already received their glorified bodies when they were resurrected with Jesus and ascended to heaven, and given that a harvest consists of three parts, we know that there will be two more resurrection events that will include those who had faith in Jesus. These include a main harvest event before the start of the tribulation period and another resurrection event at the return of Jesus to the earth, when those who would have been beheaded during the tribulation, also known as the gleanings of the harvest, will be resurrected. The second harvest, known as the wheat harvest, will be a harvest absent of faith, and this will be specifically for the nation of Israel, who is a nation without faith. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. It is interesting to note that the position that each harvest portion occupies matches the section into which the temple of God has been divided and that the 144 Israelites that will form the first fruits of the second harvest is also divisible by 24, given the 24 thrones that are positioned in the most holy place. But I digress. If you would like to look into this in more detail, please watch the Rapture series on my channel and specifically part 2 in that series in which we look at how to understand what is known as the first resurrection. So new bodies are given at resurrection events, and some will be resurrected to everlasting life, while those who died with dead spirits will be resurrected with bodies that will be forever tormented. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Those who believe that their existence stops when they die should pay very careful attention to this passage. Until one of these resurrection events occurs, we are stuck in these bodies of death while we are alive, and there is nothing that we can do to change the fact that they are corrupt and sinful. Our bodies are not going to be acceptable to God in their current form, no matter what we do. That is why we will receive new glorified bodies in order to be acceptable to God and to stand before Him being clothed with Jesus' righteousness. So what we understand then from this is that when we are saved, our dead spirit is quickened or brought to life and becomes one with the Holy Spirit. There is no more distinction between our spirit and the Holy Spirit. This is a completed work that happens at salvation, and by this we are sealed with the promise of also receiving a glorified spiritual body when we are resurrected or changed, should we still be alive at the time when the rapture occurs. After the point at which we are saved, there is nothing left for us to do to improve the condition of our spirit. Our spirit is indistinguishable from the Holy Spirit, and as such we cannot improve on what the Holy Spirit completed. Because our bodies are corrupt and sinful, no work that we do in our bodies will be acceptable to God, as any work that is performed in our flesh will be tainted with sin. But Jesus took that sin upon Him, and all of our sins, past, present and future, had already been forgiven and we are no longer guilty before our Heavenly Father, based on what Jesus did on our behalf. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What about our soul? Our soul is positioned between our body and our spirit, and before we are saved it is completely associated with the body or the flesh. Paul tells us that we have to renew our minds, and this is the process of shifting our focus from that which we do in our bodies to that which is done in our spirit. This is the only area in our beings where we have the opportunity to do something about the condition of that part. This is what Paul writes. And be not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Once our spirit has become one with the Holy Spirit, there is nothing more that we can do to improve our spiritual state or to sanctify our spirit or to add to what Jesus did on our behalf. We cannot move closer to God or please Him more in our spirits, as this ultimate work had already been completed in us by the Holy Spirit when we received His eternal seed within our spirit when we were born again. The Bible tells us that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we no longer sin because the Holy Spirit cannot sin, and since He has become one with our spirit, our spirit man no longer sins either. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. I always wondered how John could say that we no longer sin, and then quoted a verse such as, the following, which would seem to be contradicting what he said in 1 John 3 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The understanding is obtained when we realize the difference between our spirit man and our sinful flesh, which will be separated at a point in the future, if we are currently alive. Our eternal life does not depend on our carnal bodies. We will be rid of them sometime in the future and will then be completely sinless based on what Jesus did for us. Now that we have looked at what happens when we are saved, let us delve in a bit deeper and look at some of the perspectives among Christians regarding our salvation. As in any loving relationship that we enter, we find it important to please the other party because we love them. We love who they are, we love what we feel like when we are with them, and we want to do everything in our power to please them. A similar situation occurs when we are saved and enter into a relationship with our Heavenly Father through His Holy Spirit that lives in us. Our motive is to please Him for what He has done for us, and not to disappoint Him. However, the sinful flesh that we occupy is the biggest hurdle in our relationship with Him. When we are carnally minded, we focus on the flesh and not the spirit, and this is where the renewing of our minds come in. Shifting our focus from our flesh, about which we can do nothing, and looking at the spiritual. This is why people feel that they have to do things in their flesh, in order to please God and to become worthy in His eyes. What does the Bible show us regarding our responsibilities that form part of our salvation? What do we have to do to receive salvation in the first place? And secondly, what do we have to do after we are saved? Are we only required to have faith in Jesus as the Son of God who came to set us free? Or are there certain things that we have to do in order to guarantee our salvation as we live our lives? Let us look at what the Word of God says, and these passages are often put forward when arguing that keeping the law of Moses is required after we are saved to ensure that we remain saved. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now in order to understand what James is saying here, we need to understand what the works that he mentions are referring to. According to the word of God, there are two kinds of works. There is the works of the law, also called the works of the flesh, which fails to justify us. And this is what Jesus had to save us from because of our inability to do what is required. In the flesh we are not able to keep the law according to God's standards. The other option is that James is referring to the works of God or the works of the Holy Spirit that works through us. Is James talking about the works of the flesh or the works of the law that we perform in the body, which is sinful, which fails to justify us, 
and for which Jesus had to lay down his life in order to set us free, and that these have to accompany our faith? Or is he talking about the works that the Holy Spirit performs through us when we have faith in Jesus? If James was referring to the works of our flesh that we do in our sinful bodies, then that would make no sense and it would go against what we read in the following passages. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. From these two passages we see that James could not have been referring to the works that we do in the flesh, as these are the works of darkness, and this is what we needed saving from in the first place. The works that James is referring to must then relate to that which only the Holy Spirit can do through us. All our righteous works that we do in the flesh are as filthy rags to our Heavenly Father, and faith accompanied by filthy rags will surely not be evidence of our salvation, or our faith for that matter. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. What did James mean then, and what does the word of God tell us about the works of God, or the works of the Spirit, and what can we do to do the works of God? One passage in which we are clearly shown what the works of God are is found in John 6. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. The question then is, okay, if we believe in Jesus as the Son of God, what is the work that is associated with that? Because this would seem to point to faith and not any action on our part, other than trusting in Jesus. We find another clue in the book of Revelation where Jesus evaluates the seven churches and each of them is promised a reward if they overcome the world. Overcoming the world surely has to involve some action on the part of each church, right? We have to do things that will show our Heavenly Father that we are not as bad as the world by getting rid of sin in our lives and living holy lives, right? This is what many people will tell others to do, not only to overcome the world, but also to keep their salvation. However, we can only go on what the Word of God says, and the Word of God remains our ultimate truth. What it means to overcome the world, as well as the work involved with that, is given to us in 1 John 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Can you see that overcoming the world must be a work of God alone? In other words, a work that is performed by the Holy Spirit that lives in our spirit man. It is not a work that we can perform in our sinful flesh, because the work of God as explained to us in John 6 and overcoming the world as explained to us in 1 John 5 both involve us placing our complete faith in Jesus and allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work through us. Jesus confirms this by saying the following, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Considering the works that James refers to, what does Paul mean then when he talks about fighting the good fight of faith? Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. From what I understand, the Word of God shows us that the world and sin will try to drag us down to do what the God of this world would have us believe, and that would result in having us perform the works of the flesh in order to obtain reward. When we combine these passages, it is clear that the work that we are expected to do only centers around our spirit man, 
and exclusively requires us to have faith in Jesus alone. Looking then at what James said from another angle, if we put our faith in Jesus, but we also add the works of the flesh to that from which Jesus had to come and save us, believing that in doing so we draw closer to our Heavenly Father, and by doing so we also earn the right to keep our salvation. Do you believe that this was what James was suggesting? Is that not mixing the works of darkness and the failure of our flesh with trusting Jesus only halfway? Is this view not a view of salvation through faith, with our filthy rags added to what Jesus did for us? Is the correct understanding of what James is saying not pointing us to believing in Jesus, no matter what circumstances we may face in the world? Is this not acting out our faith in Jesus, when we are given the option to choose between Jesus or our flesh, even to the point where our choice could mean losing our lives? Let me give you an example which I believe will provide a perfect demonstration of works of God that are associated with faith. When Daniel knew that King Darius made a decree in which the king should be worshipped by all his subjects, what example did Daniel give us to understand what the works of the Spirit are that are associated with faith? We read the following. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and prayed, and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. Daniel knew what the consequences would be for acting out or working out his faith, but he had no fear of man, and he fought for his faith in God, above submitting to the king's command, or submitting to the fear of losing his life. This work that he did put his own life at risk, but Daniel did not waver in his faith that he put in God. Daniel did not doubt his God's ability to save him from whatever fears he may have faced in the future, and as such he remained steadfast in his faith. You can also see what King Darius said to Daniel as Daniel was cast into the lion's den. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Even King Darius had faith in Daniel's God to deliver him from the lions, and as we all know, Daniel came out of the lion's den without a scratch on him. Now is this not a perfect example from the word of God, where faith is accompanied by works that prove the authenticity of that faith. It also resulted in a miracle that kept Daniel alive against any worldly odds. Works that accompany faith from what I see written in the word of God is acting out what you have put your trust in Jesus for. If we believe that the works that James are referring to imply keeping the law of God or to do the works of the flesh, can you see how it does not fit the model shown to us in Daniel's case? Daniel did not focus on the works of his flesh when he put his faith in the Lord. He simply trusted the Lord to take care of him under all circumstances, and acted or worked according to his faith. So when we consider the corruptible bodies that we live in, it should be clear that the work that Jesus did on the cross impacts our spirit being only. That work also seals us with a promise to look forward to of a glorified body that will follow in the future. If we have this promise and Jesus came to save us from our inability to keep the law because of our sinful flesh, why do we expect the problem we experience in our bodies, which is our continued battle with sin, to go away after we are saved? The flesh is where sin has a foothold. And until we are rid of these bodies, we will experience sin in our lives. I think we often believe that when we are saved, we should be able to reach a point where sin is completely erased from our beings. But given that the promise with which we are sealed specifically points us to that which will happen in the future, we should expect to encounter sin in our lives, up to the day that we are rid of our bodies 
even though we have already been forgiven for sins that we have not even committed yet. What about the works that we do in the flesh, where we do good deeds in the world to benefit others and to the glory of God, and where we try to keep the law of Moses in order to please God and to draw close to Him? From what the Bible shows me, works that we do, where the Holy Spirit is not the guiding force behind them, and where faith in Jesus alone is absent, will not provide us with any benefit. We read the following in Galatians. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even as we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I would argue that based on what is written in this passage, any work that we try to do in the flesh to prove ourselves worthy to God would be considered wood, hay and stubble before God, because we are not able to please our Heavenly Father in our flesh. This is why the law was given to us, to make us aware of our sinfulness and that we needed a Savior to set us free from our sins. So what role does works that we do in the flesh, such as trying to keep the law of God after we are saved, play in our walk as Christians according to the word of God? To get a better understanding of this, we need to first understand what God's standards are, not based on people's opinions, but as explained to us in his word. And I believe the Lord wants us to discuss this in order to get to the truth. So I will do my best to share with you what I understand from His Word. So what are our Heavenly Father's standards when it comes to His law and how people should keep it? One place in which we are shown is James chapter 2. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. What does this mean? This means that with our Heavenly Father it is a black or white situation. You are either completely sinless, in which case you are guiltless and acceptable to the Father, just as Jesus was, or you are guilty of transgressing every single law in the Word of God. There is no gray area here, not even after we are saved. The Bible clearly tells us that God is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. And when we are saved, we certainly do not have the liberty to adjust our Heavenly Father's standards to suit us. Jesus Christ the same, yesterday and today and forever. When it comes to being saved, there is only one way in which we can be saved. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The problem with believing that we can through the works of repentance become more holy in the Father's eyes after we are saved is firstly missing the fact that we are still living in corruptible bodies which will be sinful until we are rid of them. And secondly, it is lowering God's standards as given to us in His word and introducing a grey area in which we feel justified for failing at being perfect at the law. The Bible tells us the following. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Even Paul, who claimed to have kept the law perfectly, and who stated that he brought his body under submission, were given a thorn in his flesh to have him realize that he was not going to win his fight against sin, and that he could only rely on the promise of God to save him from what he calls the body of this death. We read about this in Romans 7. Read this carefully. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, 
warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul also said the following about his walk in life according to the law. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul explained to the Philippians that he was blameless according to the law, and yet sin was still found in him, and a messenger of Satan was allowed to attack him in order to keep him reliant on Christ alone, and not on his own works. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, given this understanding and keeping in mind that in our Heavenly Father's eyes we are either completely without sin or otherwise guilty of all sin, when we say that once people are saved they cannot continue in sin and expect to remain saved or expect our Heavenly Father to be pleased with that, what are we saying? In effect we are claiming that it is possible to introduce a grey area into God's standards. We are saying that it is more acceptable to the Father when we sin less than when we sin more. We are saying that if we work hard at it, we are able to become more like Jesus through what we do, instead of understanding that any sin whatsoever in our lives makes us guilty of all, even if we have only an angry thought after we are saved. Given that we exist in corruptible bodies, the answer to the questions should be clear. We will never be able to achieve any measure of success against sin according to God's standards while we live in these bodies. They are sinful and form part of our existence until we are rid of them. If we believe that we are more acceptable to God when we sin less than others, we become hypocrites believing that we are able to judge others based on our ability to rise above them in what we do, even though we are and remain just as guilty as they are in the flesh based on God's standards and not that of man. We also deceive ourselves by believing things about the Word of God and ourselves that are not true, and these make us lukewarm in God's eyes. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked, when we change God's standards and believe that we can become more like Jesus by living in a certain way or by doing certain things in our sinful flesh, then we deceive ourselves and we lose our savor. This way we allow pride to come into our lives and we begin to believe that by repenting daily and by doing all kinds of things our bodies will have less death in them and become more acceptable to the Lord. This does not match God's standards, and neither are these considered the works of God, and according to God's word, 
these would only be able to bring in wood, hay and stubble. If we want to do the works of God, we have to overcome the world and what does the world do? The world has been conditioned to work for reward and we all want to prove ourselves worthy. What is the commandment or commandments that were given to Jesus to share with us and which pleases the Father? We read the following. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Jesus did what pleased the Father when he took on the form of a servant. He was the only one who ever lived who was able to live a life that was void of any sin. If we want to do the works of God, we have to overcome the world. And what, what does the world do? Work for reward, or promotion, or wages. Jesus also tells us that the Father gave him a commandment that would lead to everlasting life. This is what he said. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say, and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. What is this commandment that were given to us by the Father through Jesus in order to obtain everlasting life? Does this involve daily repentance? Does it involve sinning less? This is what we are told. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus does not say that the Father's desire is for us to live our lives in a certain way, and that we have to do this or do that in order to receive everlasting life. All that He desires, according to His word, is for us to believe on His Son, that He sent for us out of His incomprehensible love for us. Is this not amazing? By putting our faith in Jesus, we not only obey the Father's commandment, but we also overcome the world. The world and its religions rely on works, and having faith in Jesus as the Son of God is something the world cannot do. Does this not mean that we have to believe in Jesus and do the works of the law in order to keep God's commandments? What does John mean by saying that his commandments are not grievous? I believe the next verse emphasizes our freedom in Christ when we put all our faith and trust in Jesus, knowing that He has forgiven us of all our sins, including those that we will do in the future, and has given us a promise of glorified bodies that will replace our corrupt bodies that we currently occupy, adding nothing to what Jesus did. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Having faith in Jesus as our Savior without trying to add to what He did for us is the ultimate prize that we can aspire to, and yet people find it very difficult to accept, and because of our conditioning in the world, we want to do things to please our Heavenly Father and to show Him that we are worthy of His respect. Am I saying that it is okay to sin? Not at all. I am saying that we cannot rid ourselves of sin while we live in corruptible bodies, and if we try, then we will be disappointed every time, and in addition to that, if we believe that we please our Heavenly Father by doing so, we trample on what Jesus paid a very great price for on our behalf. We know that nothing we do with respect to sin in our lives will ever impress our Heavenly Father based on His all or nothing standard. If we were able to make our bodies more holy through the works that we do, even to a point where sin was no longer part of our bodies, then why would there be a need for the promise of glorified bodies? People who believe that they can draw closer to God by ignoring God's standards 
and believing that our sinful bodies will earn God's respect, ignore what is written in the following passage. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. No sinful flesh will ever glory in the presence of God. This is why God sealed us with a promise to redeem us from our sinful bodies in order for us to receive the promise, which is to get new glorified bodies so that we can enter His presence. Our works and attempts at improving something that is already condemned only shames our Redeemer, who did everything on our behalf in order to obtain that promise for us. So whether we are saved and believe that Jesus died for our sins, and we only fail at controlling our thoughts, or whether we are saved but we struggle with stealing or swearing or smoking or drinking or whatever other sins, according to the word of God it makes no difference whatsoever in our Heavenly Father's eyes. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Even though our bodies may be out of line and out of control to a varying degree when compared between different people, it is the state of our spirit that is important. Has your spirit been sealed by God through your faith in what Jesus did on your behalf? And are you waiting on the promise of God without trying to impress Him by throwing filthy rags back at Him? Obviously, when we are in a loving relationship with someone, we will have a desire and longing to make that other person happy. That is how God made us, and that is what love is, putting the other person before yourself. Obviously, we would want to do that which is pleasing to God as well, when we are born again and received His salvation. If we, however, believe that by doing things in our flesh, we can make our Heavenly Father happy, we are also deceived, because nothing that we do in our flesh is pleasing to God, as it is tainted with sin. Only in our spirit are we able to please the Lord. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. So if we cannot please our Heavenly Father in the flesh and by the things that we do, why should we keep sin from our lives? A very sensible and valid reason, in my opinion, is to keep Satan out and to deny him legal entry into our lives and to prevent him from causing trouble for us, especially when we look at the instructions given to us in the following passage, when we cast off the works of darkness. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. What is the armor of light, and how is that opposed to the works of darkness? We serve a righteous God who responds to legal requests from Satan, and when we allow sin into our lives, if we fail to keep our eyes on Jesus alone, and we move out from under God's protection, we open ourselves up to the attacks of Satan. Satan accuses us day and night before the throne, and if we allow sin in our lives, he can obtain the legal right to attack us. We see this explained in the following two passages. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This is why our Heavenly Father gave us the spiritual armor of light, as described to us in Ephesians 6. If we put on the armor provided to us by our Heavenly Father, even though we are sinners, we can go onto the battlefield and wage war. 
because of what has happened in our spirit when we are saved and not because of our ability to prove to God that we deserve His respect or protection from Satan because of what we do in our flesh after we are saved. If we believe as truth something which contradicts what is written in the Word of God, such as allowing fear into our lives and thinking that we will be protected against Satan's attack because of what we do in our flesh, then we do not have the truth that keeps all of our spiritual armor together, and Satan can legally hurt us. That is why it's very important to study our spiritual armor as well as the Word of God, and to understand what is involved, and to ensure that you have the truth. When we are saved, we are dead to sin as far as our salvation goes, and in our daily lives. We have been set free of the judgment of our sin, and as we still live in sinful corruptible bodies, there is nothing we can do to fix that. God has given us His word so that we can know that our battle is not with the flesh, but it is spiritual, and that is why we need spiritual armor in order to successfully wage war against Satan in spite of our sinful bodies. God is also righteous and keeps His word. And when we walk onto the battlefield, which is life, without being properly arrayed in our battle gear, then we allow our accuser, who watches us day and night for an opportunity to attack, to come against us. God allows this based on the fact that He is righteous, and just as a righteous judge would give a fair ruling, God will allow Satan to attack us if we move out from underneath His protection or if we lose some of our battle gear on the battlefield described to us in Ephesians 6. I would like to look at two examples from the Word of God to show this in action. In Job, we read about a conversation between Satan and God, where God tells him about Job, who God declared a righteous man. Based on what we understand from the rest of the Word of God, why was Satan allowed to attack Job so severely, in light of wearing spiritual armor. Secondly, as we have seen earlier, we have another case with Daniel, where he was thrown into the lion's den, and came out of that without a scratch. What are the differences between these two situations, and why did Daniel suffer no harm, while Job, on the other hand, suffered greatly? Is God unfair in his dealings with man? Let us look at Job first. We read the following. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned, and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Even though what Job did, as described in this passage, would seem to be commendable, it involved fear. He greatly feared what his children was doing and what may have happened to them if they committed sin against God. Instead of trusting the Lord to protect his children, even though they were sinful, he focused on their possible sins against the Lord. Is this not what we do when we try to rid ourselves of sin in our bodies, when the Word of God shows us that our bodies will remain sinful until we are rid of them, and rather focus on Jesus alone and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us and to do God's work with the body that is available to him, even though it is sinful. The fact that Job feared for his children shows us that he may have valued them too highly and that he did not place his faith in the Lord alone to keep them safe from harm. Let us see how Job's fear is described to us. For the thing which I greatly feared is come up on me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof, and image was before mine eyes, there was silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his Maker? 
God is righteous, and if Satan stood before God, accusing Job for allowing fear in his life, what would God's righteous ruling on this be according to his word? I believe we find the answer to the ruling in the following passages. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. When we consider our spiritual armor, which aspect was the main reason for Satan's successful attack on Job? This is what we read in Ephesians 6. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So because fear has torment, and our Heavenly Father being righteous even to Satan, Satan's attack on Job succeeded because Job was standing on the battlefield without his shield of faith in God, and as such Satan pierced him with his arrows. Job did not suffer because God was angry with him, or because God wanted to punish him, but because Satan accused Job and God is righteous and keeps his word even to Satan. Let us compare this to what is explained to us in Daniel's case and see how his actions or works differed from that of Job. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Daniel knew with absolute certainty what would happen to him if he disobeyed the king's commandment. But did Daniel fear that possibility? Daniel did not care about the decree of the king or what could happen to him. Why? Because he had faith in God. Even when King Darius realized his mistake, he too placed his faith in Daniel's God, as we can see in the following passage. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Do you see faith in God in action here? Daniel could have looked at his own sinfulness and could have said, I have too many sins, God will not save me from this situation because of them. Is this not what we often do? We look at the inadequacy of our bodies and the sin that remain in them, and because of that we are reluctant to have complete faith in the Lord, believing that because of our sins we build a wall between us and Him. This is not true when we look at what Jesus came to do. He has set us free from all of our sins, past, present and future, and no sin that exists in our body can affect what has happened in our spirit. Daniel's focus was only on his God, and not even facing certain death distracted him from keeping his eyes focused on his God. He had his spiritual shield up to fend off all the arrows of Satan. Even if Satan looked for an opportunity to attack him, he had no legal right to attack, because of Daniel's steadfastness in the situation he faced. Daniel's own sin did not play any role in this situation. Only the works of God, which Daniel clearly allowed to work through him, allowed him to emerge from this situation victoriously. Now, what can we learn from this? It is very important to look at our lives in the Spirit. We need to know who we are in Christ, in spite of the bodies that we still occupy, and we need to ensure that we put on our spiritual armor every day. If we do this, then Satan, who is looking for every opportunity to attack, will not succeed in doing so. The belt of truth is also very important. When we have a wrong understanding of the Word of God, or if we believe people's opinions about the Word of God, instead of reading what is written in the supernatural book and accepting it at face value, and believing what God says instead of going with popular opinion, 
We have nothing to keep the rest of our armor together and we experience hardship in our lives. We are obviously not going to succeed in this right from when we receive salvation, as it is a process requiring the Holy Spirit to renew our minds and to show us the truth from God's word as we continue to study it. But even when Satan succeeds in attacking us, the Bible tells us that God even uses this for our own good. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. We land in terrible situations because we deviate from what God tells us in His Word. But from those bad experiences, we are able to help others who are headed down the same path. Obviously, we learn on the way and we would hopefully avoid making the same mistakes again. But our experience of the chastisement we receive is there to help others not to make the same mistakes. I have recently shared one such an experience I had when I was a lot younger with someone who found themselves in a similar situation and they turned away from the path that they were headed down and I'm still amazed at the fact that God used my experience and hardship to prevent others from making the same mistake. God's love for us is just truly amazing. So how do we know then, once we are saved, whether what we do comes from the Holy Spirit that lives in us or whether what we do is coming from our flesh? According to the Word of God, we have to inspect the fruit of our actions in order to tell the difference. If what we do makes us feel guilty, inadequate, dirty, sinful, ashamed, disappointed, or like a failure, or have us sit with doubts, then we know that it does not come from the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, when we see the fruit of the Spirit in what we do, such as written in Galatians 5 or 1 Timothy 6, then we know that it is from the Spirit and that we were used by God to do His will. When this happens, you will know with 100% certainty that your flesh was not involved, and it is like standing on the sidelines while you watch the Holy Spirit work through you. You immediately know when this happens, and this is not something you would have to wonder about either. It fills you with joy, peace, amazement, love, immense gratitude, honor, the feeling of being highly favored, and uncontainable excitement. You know with 100% certainty that you, in your flesh, had nothing to do with the work that was just done through you. And this is what it means to have faith in Jesus alone, and to do the works of God. It is putting our own ideas of what we think needs to happen in the world on the side and making ourselves 100% available to our Heavenly Father to perform His purpose in this world through our sinful bodies. And this gives us peace that transcends all understanding. It is leaving behind that which we think we have to do to please the Lord and allowing the Holy Spirit to use us to do the work that pleases the Father through our faith in Jesus Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now that we have looked at the subject of salvation and having faith in God as the work that pleases our Father, let us next look at some of the comments that people make surrounding salvation and the works that accompany it. The first one is this. How can people who do not try to keep the law after they are saved expect to remain saved if they continue in sin? I think it should be clear now that our salvation is a completed work that occurs based only on what Jesus accomplished on the cross on our behalf. When our spirit becomes one with the Holy Spirit, there is no longer my spirit and the Holy Spirit. 
It is one entity that has become our regenerated spirit man. Our Heavenly Father tells us that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And once our spirit has become one with the Holy Spirit, there is no way in which He would break that promise, as we can see in the following passage. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The only reason for which I see a person putting themselves in a position where they would lose their salvation would be to accept the mark of the beast during the tribulation. From what I understand, this will change the image in which humans are made from the image of God to the image of the beast. And salvation is not available to those who follow after the beast. This mark will essentially change the DNA of people that accept it and will mingle their DNA with that of fallen angels, just as in the days of Noah, when God had to cleanse the earth from this corruption. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. What about the following comment? We draw closer to God when we repent daily of our sins, and this allows us to walk a closer walk with God. If our spirit has become one with the Holy Spirit, there is no possible way in which we can get any closer to God. If we experience hardship in our lives after coming to salvation, believing that it is God punishing us, we do not have the truth, as God's anger was poured out over Jesus, who paid the full price to remove all the sins of the entire world for any who would put their faith in Him. And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. When we repent of our sins daily, our focus is on what we do and not on who Jesus is by placing our faith in Him and focusing on what He wants to do through us by the Holy Spirit that lives in us. This view also does not recognize the fact that God's standards exclude our sinful flesh and that any attempt by ourselves to rid ourselves of sins will be met with disappointment and feelings of guilt which affect our faith that we need to have in Jesus. Let us look at the next comment. Not wanting to keep God's commandments by doing what is written in the Torah is looking for an excuse to continue in our desire to sin. As Paul said in Romans 7, the desire in his inner man exists to do the law, but in our bodies we find a different law at work which is that of sin that wars against our spirit man. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Those who believe that they are able to keep the laws of the Torah have deceived themselves and are claiming that what Jesus came to do for them, which is to set them free from the judgment for failure to keep the Torah, is no longer needed as they can make it on their own. This is what I believe is referred to in Hebrews 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, 
and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. I would like to explain what is written in Hebrews 6 by making use of the following analogy, as many people feel confused when they read the negative connotation to repentance that is given in this passage. Our salvation, which is followed by good works that we do in the flesh, or that of trying to keep the law, is similar to realizing that you are trapped in a mud pit, and there is no way to get yourself out of the mud or to rid yourself of the mud, and the only way you are able to get clean and out of the mud is if you were lifted out by someone outside of the pit, who then washes you clean and gave you their clean clothes to wear. This is what Jesus did for us. He took us out of our sins, which we could not get rid of ourselves, and gave us His righteousness, without us deserving it in any way or being in a position to repay Him for that. If, after we are saved, we go back to repentance and attempt to turn from our sins every day, what are we doing? Are we not trying to undo that which Jesus already accomplished in full on our behalf? Compared to the mud pit analogy, what happens when we do this? Instead of just confessing our sins, thanking God for removing all our sins, whether they be past, present or future, and realizing that we are now standing outside of the pit, dressed in the clean clothes that Jesus provided for us to wear, and thanking Him for it, those who want to go back to law-keeping, after being saved, jump back into the pit, messing up the clean clothes they were given, and believing that now that they have been washed and have received clean clothes, they can please the person who gave us His righteousness, by getting back into the mud and trying to wipe the mud from themselves all over again. If you gave such a person your clean clothes to wear and they jumped back into the mud in order to repeat that which they failed at in the first place with the intention to get closer to you, how would that make you feel? Not only is such an action irrational, but it is also void of appreciation. It is focused on self and our own fallible abilities, and one would think that only through pride and being blinded to the truth would one take such actions, believing that they are able to accomplish something in their own power, which they clearly could not do before they were pulled from the pit. And yet, this is what many Christians are fighting for, the opportunity to get back into the pit and to take others with them, so they can try to clean their clothes themselves and make our Heavenly Father proud of them by doing so. I believe these are referred to in Revelation where we read about those who had to wash their robes of Jesus' righteousness again in the blood of the Lamb, after they soiled them with their own attempts at what only Jesus can do. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Here is the next comment. I am only covered by the blood of Jesus if I live my life by doing His will. This comment would once again put the focus on what we do instead of what Jesus did on our behalf. Jesus' blood covers the sins of the entire world, but we have to accept that through faith, which happens in our spirit, and not by working for it in our flesh. For if ye live after the flesh ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. One final comment that I would like to address, which is in my opinion very important, is the following that a person left on one of the other videos in this channel. This is what he said. The tribulation is the refining fire that we all must go through because the church has too much sin in it. There are a number of issues to address here and we must once again focus on God's standards and the truth as given to us from the Word of God. 
With our Heavenly Father, there is no gray area where less sin is more acceptable than more sin. It is either being completely without sin, which only Jesus could do, and having His righteousness imputed to us, or it is jumping back into the mud and trying to wipe ourselves clean, believing that our Heavenly Father would be impressed with us, trying to do again that which He had to save us from in the first place. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Secondly, this view would seem to claim that the work that Jesus did on the cross in order to complete that which the Father sent him to do is not really complete as it requires Jesus' blood plus our own efforts in the flesh to clean ourselves in order to be pleasing to the Father. This is shifting our focus from faith in Jesus alone to trusting in our own abilities which are filthy rags thrown back at our Heavenly Father. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Thirdly, this view would also assign attributes to the character of our Heavenly Father that are clearly shown to us in His Word not to be part of His character. If we believe that our Heavenly Father will punish those whom He loved so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die for us so that we would not have to, why would He have to punish us again for something that was already paid for in full? In addition, the Bible tells us that we are not appointed to wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus. This is the truth with which we should gird our loins. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. To claim that the church has to go through the fire of purification is claiming that a loving bridegroom would first have to burn his bride, which he is in love with before marrying her, in order for her to be acceptable. We would never consider such action from any bridegroom on earth who loves his bride. All earthly bridegrooms are sinful people, and we would never expect to see a bridegroom maiming his wife-to-be with fire before he marries her, as this would be considered cruel and malicious under any circumstances. And yet, these are the properties that we assign to our heavenly bridegroom when we believe that he requires us to be purified by the fire of purification. This view also goes directly against what is written in Genesis about our Heavenly Father's character, where he shared a conversation with Moses, who wrote it down, that took place between God and Abraham. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? In this passage, our Heavenly Father tells us that He will never slay the righteous with the wicked. However, this is not the only passage that shows us that the church is not destined for purification through fire, which is intended for the wicked. In Ephesians 5, we read the following. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This passage from Ephesians clearly shows us that our bridegroom will wash us in water, not burn us with fire, and that he does all the cleansing on our behalf. We cannot cleanse ourselves, and He also presents us to Himself, not requiring us to perform any works in our flesh in order to be acceptable to Him. If we believe that we serve a Lord that is cruel, then we have no intimacy with Him, and we do not know Him. These are the attributes of the evil servant which Jesus spoke of in Matthew 25.
Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed? Essentially, the evil servant tells his master that he knows that he is a cruel person and a thief, throwing insults at his master because he had preconceived ideas about his character which were false. And there is obviously a lack of intimacy between this servant and the master. The end of the evil servant is exactly the same as that of the five virgins who failed to take extra oil with them, and those who asked the Lord to be let into his kingdom who relied on their own wonderful works rather than that which Jesus accomplished on their behalf. And they had to hear from the Lord's mouth that they were not known by him. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Notice that Jesus states in this passage that only those who do the will of the Father are known by him and will be allowed to enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you remember what the will of the Father is? And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I hope the information in this video answered some of the questions that many have and will show you from the Word of God who we are in Christ. I know this may be contentious in some people's minds and they may disagree with it, but all I am offering is the truth as I understand it from the Word of God, taking into account the standards by which God judges our actions in the flesh. The works that we do after we are saved have to be works of the Spirit and not works of the flesh, for they are simply wood, hay, and stubble. When God works through us, when we put our faith in Him, we stand amazed at what is accomplished through us and not by us. We simply yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit living in us, to do the amazing works of God in the world, while we stand on the sidelines and watch, and in spite of the fact that we live in sinful bodies. We put on the spiritual armor of God daily to fend off Satan's attacks, and in doing so we limit his abilities to bring hardship over our lives. When we bind Satan by keeping our armor on, it increases our faith, and it is similar to attacking an enemy that is bound and cannot act. It requires us to follow the commandment that our Heavenly Father gave to us through Jesus, and that is to put all of our faith in Jesus only. It also requires us to know the truth because that keeps our armor together. And when we exchange the truth of God's word for our own understanding, then Satan receives the opportunity to attack us. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. My advice to you is to study the Word of God daily and to search the Scriptures daily and to ask our Heavenly Father to reveal the truth of His Word to you, even if it goes against what you currently believe. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus in all situations and put no value on anything else in this life, even if it involves your family, your earthly possessions or anything else, even if it costs you your own life. 
Rely only on what Jesus did for you and praise our Heavenly Father daily for His incredible love for you and see how the Holy Spirit will use you when you make yourself available to Him. May God bless you and keep you and may He make His face shine upon you in the short time that remains for us on the earth. Keep watching and keep praying and I look forward to meet every person who watches this video in the air soon. God bless.